Amen, but we got through it. All right. Let's take our Bibles now and turn to the book of Exodus, the text which we read just a few moments ago, a very critical text also as we look at what is going on. I praise God for Dan Waite and Dr. Waite uh, taking the pulpit for the last two weeks. I trust that you received a blessing out of that, but we're back now to the book of Exodus. We're in chapter 2. And we're looking at verses 11 through 15, Exodus chapter 2. And so three weeks ago, which was the time that we were looking at when it was right to disobey the king, we learned a few principles that Moses didn't quite understand when we get to the text for today. He decided to take some things into his own hands when he knew that they were wrong. You recall that as we looked at those texts earlier, we saw that Pharaoh had a plan to curtail the Jews, and he used first slavery and rigorous work, and then he used partial birth abortion or infanticide, as we see in the final case. And none of those things worked. We saw that Stephen makes reference to this as a key point in the history of Israel. And at that time we noted that this is also a key issue here in the United States. We're at a critical juncture and we celebrated, you recall, a couple of weeks ago, the tremendously bad decision of the United States Supreme Court in Roe versus Wade. The first issue that we looked at when we talked about the midwives there was, did God bless them for their lying? We saw that scripture condemns lying as from the devil. Jesus says so himself in John chapter 8, verse 44. He's not talking about just big lies or generally lies. He's talking about all lies, even those which we consider to be so-called white lies. We saw that that question was intensified by the fact that Rahab, the harlot, lied to hide the spies, and yet she is listed in the heroes of faith. But we saw that not once in Scripture are either the midwives or Rahab commended for their lying, but they are commended only for two things. Just like God may count you in a list of heroes of faith, and you have many sins in your life, but he does not commend you for those sins, but for the things which you have done by faith 
in obedience to his word in the power of the Spirit of God. Those are the three tests for works that are pleasing to God. And so remember, even believers tell sins and tell lies, but that doesn't make it right. What they were commended for was their faith in the living God and their obedience to divine law, which is superior to human law. The second lesson that we learned at that time, you recall, was that God is sovereign. He is able to work out the problems without us having to tell lies or compromise or violate the standards of his word. It does not mean that God is obligated to rescue you. He may allow you to go through the fire of death. But he has guaranteed that he will work it for your good and for his glory, which is supreme in all the things that he does. That set the stage for us as to when to disobey the king, and that includes all others in authority. And we saw, and this is something you will hear me say, if the Lord tarries, lets me live, and we are all together for sermons in the future, you will hear me say it many times, the question of oughtness and obligation is the question that relates to obedience to authority. It's not a question of choice. You never have an option of choosing when to disobey because it is never an option. You see, disobedience is required when it is an obligation. When the word of God requires you to disobey, otherwise the scripture assumes that those whom God has placed in positions of authority must be obeyed unless you have one of six different possible options, if you will, obligations, more like it, for when you must disobey. When the one in authority requires you to disobey the Bible, that's an obligation to disobey the one in authority. When the one in authority prohibits you from obeying the Bible, that's an obligation to disobey the one in authority. When a lower authority requires you to disobey a higher authority within the chain of command that God has established, you must disobey the lower authority in order to obey the higher authority. When a lower authority prohibits you from obeying a higher authority, and the same principle applies, and the same when a, one in authority requires you to lie or to keep silent about the truth, or when the one in authority requires you to pit one biblical requirement against another biblical requirement. God does not have his word in conflict with itself. What disobedience is not. We didn't have time to cover this at that point, so I want to go over this quickly. Required disobedience is not a matter of emotions. Too many of us function on the basis of our emotions, and we very soon run into problems like the charismatics do. The issue is not how we feel about a command or a prohibition or a directive from those in authority. That leads to doctrinal and practical error and leads you astray because your emotions will always take you away from the word of God. Required disobedience is never a matter of the emotions. Number two, required disobedience is never a matter of experience. You think you know better than the one in authority over you. You think you have a better way of solving the problem. You've been through this before and so you feel that you've got a better grasp of the situation than the one who has given you a command. Disobedience, when it is required by the Bible, is not a matter of your experience. Number three, required disobedience, that which the Word of God says you must do to be faithful to God, is not a matter of rational powers. Man's mind has fallen in the fall, as well as his emotions, and as well as the clouded experiences that he has in daily life. Back in 1275, a Roman Catholic theologian by the name of Thomas Aquinas wrote a book called Summa Theologica, Highest Theology, an arrogant title for a book. But in that, he declared that man had fallen in every way except in his intellect, and that he could reason his way back to God. 
that is contrary to scripture, and yet many Christians today, because of the advanced sciences that we have and because of the educations that we have, feel that we can use rational thought to decide when we will obey and when we will not obey. It is not a matter of rational powers. Obedience is not a matter of the one under authority having a greater intellect or a greater reasoning power, or a greater knowledge, or any other temporal characteristic than the one who is in authority. For example, there are a lot of wives that are smarter than their husbands, but they are required to be in obedience to their husbands, except as outlined in the six points that I have given you. It's not a matter of your rational capacity, and that is true in every sphere of authority which God has ordained. Number four. This is all new material. You have not heard these things before, but I'm adding them to what we had covered in that week. Disobedience is not a matter of tastes or preferences. If you're going to speak about biblical disobedience, it's not a matter of what you like and dislike. Life is full of distasteful things that we would prefer not to do. Everything about our lives is not all roses and peaches and cream. There are things in life that we are required to do. And we can't fall back on the Bible and say, well, I don't like those things, so they must not be the will of God for me. Disobedience is not a matter of tastes and preferences. We do the things that God has set before us to do, whether we like them or not, and we do them as unto the Lord. Those who disobey authority must be ready to prove that they are obeying the word of God and that they have been told to do something that is contrary to the word of God. Part of spiritual maturity and those who are mature Christians always look for ways to obey because mature Christian obedience includes being sensitive to the will of those in authority, not obstinately and defiantly doing only the things that we are forced to do. Psalm 32, 8 and 9, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in by bit and bridle lest they come near unto thee. Mature Christian obedience means being alert and eager to do the will of the one in authority because that attitude reflects our Lord Jesus Christ. It's only the immature carnal Christians who have to be given the detailed rules so that they will do what is right. You recall also that we saw as we looked at verses 1 through 10 of this chapter, there was a man of the house of Levi who took a daughter of Levi there in the same tribe, and we discovered that God has a key heritage for his elect. Very important principle is set out for us in these first 10 verses of the chapter that we have before us today. We find that sometimes those plans are being worked out in the normal course of life. In that situation, it was in the course of marriage. And we do not know in advance what the divine sovereign plan of God for us is when we enter into the normal course of life, walking by faith on a daily basis, when nothing seems to be exciting or different, just doing what is right. God takes people who walk by faith on a daily basis and has plans for them down the road that they may not yet know, but will, which will be truly for their good, for the glory of God, and for the good of God's people. We see that with Amram and Yochevet, the parents of Moses. Sometimes in the normal course of life, the Christian is faced with temptations and with conflict. In fact, he always will be. There will be those who try to make us lie, or to cheat, or to steal, or to be immoral, or to murder. And, of course, the situation we find here in Exodus 2 is murder, infanticide, throwing babies into the river. Sometimes it will be abortion. Sometimes it will be euthanasia. Sometimes it will be genetic engineering. All kinds of things are available to us today in the course of the so-called normal life in America. But we as Christians must make the right choices as we move through life that these things are sin, and we will not participate in them. Sometimes our attempts, as we saw with 
uh, Moses' mother are weak and irrational, but God honored their desire to obey his word. And God sent a compassionate woman, not a soldier. He sent the daughter of Pharaoh to find Moses. And now we're moving into a situation where Moses is recognizing his, his real background. He's going out to see his brethren. He's had his mother as his nurse and the one who raised him in infancy. And then he grew up in Pharaoh's palace and he has a struggle going on. With whom will he identify? Folks, there comes a time in the life of every one of us when we must make open identification with Jesus Christ and with the people of God. How often we try to hide it. We hide behind our money, we hide behind our jobs, we hide behind our friends, we hide behind our education. But there comes a point whereby we say, no more. I identify with the people of God for good or for evil, for bad or for good. They are my people. Someday it may cost you your life. It has cost the lives of believers in the past. It may cost your life in the future. But it is the place that we must stand. Oh, we see incredible things, how God provided wisdom for a little girl beyond her years. Young people, never be ashamed of your youth, as Paul tells Timothy. But be an example of believers. Be one who manifests forth, even in your youth, the grace of God, the mercy of God, Love for the Lord Jesus Christ, moral purity, a stand for righteousness and holiness. And God will bless you for it. We saw God meeting the needs of a mother's heart. Oh, how her heart yearned after her baby in the basket. And God provided a salvation for that child. God provided not only the right external environment, which is the testing ground for Moses, as we see in the chapter today, but he also provided the right spiritual environment. Hebrews 11 tells us that in verses 23 and following. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Moses had had it all. He was 40 years old when the events of our chapter take place. Moses was a mature man. Moses made a choice. He identified with the people of God. He made some mistakes in doing it. We see that in the text. But he made the right choice as to with whom would he be identified. If you are among God's elect, he will also provide the right so-called environment, training, and experiences for you for the purposes for which he has called you, for the job that he wants you to accomplish, for the impact that he wants you to make in this world. What are the choices that you're going to make? Will you walk by faith or will you choose to walk by sight? Will you putter along in sin or you will take a stand for righteousness? Will you live in the world under the control of the flesh and the devil? Or will you live by faith looking unto eternity and the power of the Holy Spirit? Today your sin will find you out. We've read the passage already in verses 11 through 15. But it reminds us of a very important principle which God has established in his word. In some places, we call it the law of harvest. We're not going to look at all those passages. You've heard me preach on that before. But it is, in fact, the same principle that we are dealing with. Whatsoever you sow, that is what you will reap. If you sow to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. If you sow to the spirit, you will of the spirit reap life everlasting. It's the law of harvest. What you sow is what you reap. How much you sow determines how much you reap. The type of thing that you sow will be the type of thing that you reap. The law of harvest. Let's look at the text. The first phrase, Moses is a grown man. Moses was grown. He has no excuse of claiming that he was an immature teenager. He was 40 years old at this time. 
What we need to learn from that is that we need to stop making excuses for our sins. I suspect that every one of us in here, including myself, though I have somehow shoved it, you know, but they pop up every now and then, makes excuses for our sins. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. After all, it's not so bad. It's not as bad as so-and-so, and it could be worse, in fact. Folks, we need to stop making excuses for our sins. You've been going to church for a very long time, all of you except for little teeny children. You've been hearing the Word of God preached for a very long time. You understand the principles of Bible doctrine. You understand the principles of the Christian life. It is time to stop making excuses for sin. We are soon to come before the Lord at His table. And the church at Corinth was making excuses for their sin. You should be spiritually full-grown by now. You need to understand that when we come to the Lord's table, it is serious business. God counted it such serious business that some of the people at Corinth got sick, and God killed some of them. Some of them had died. God took them off the playing field because they were not playing for his team. Moses was grown. You should be full grown. You know, and we're talking not merely about physical maturity here, we're talking about spiritual maturity. Because even children can make right choices. Children know the difference between right and wrong. Proverbs 20 verse 11 says, Even a child is known by his doings, whether his work be pure and whether it be right. Children, young people, you make choices. You will be held accountable for your choices. You will walk by faith or you will not walk by faith. You will yield to the flesh or you will resist the flesh and the power of the Spirit of God. The second phrase, he went out unto his brethren. Moses knew who he was. Moses knew who they were. Moses knew that he was not an Egyptian. He'd had some home training by his mother. How important it is, and you've heard me say this before, who the mother of the children is. As you go through the lists of kings in First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, as you look at those lists, it always names the mother. God is making a point. A mother will have an incredible impact on how her children turn out. Moses knew who his brothers were. Moses knew that he was not an Egyptian. Moses, raised in the palace, called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, was a man who had special privilege, but he was not an Egyptian. When you walk through this world, do you consider yourself one of the crowd? Where is your identification? In your employment? Yes, I'm an employee of such and such, and that is your principal way in which you identify yourself. Is it in relation to your school? Let's go so and so. And you root for the football team. And that's your principal identification. You're a graduate of that school. Is your principal identification in the size of your bank account, the size of your estate, the size of your house, the multiplicity of your possessions? Is that what gives you your identification when you walk by people Oh, and awe at you because of the suit you're wearing, the dress, the jewelry, the watch, the shoes. Or is your principal identification with Jesus Christ? And that is how people know you. You are a child of the great King. And you walk with a humble bearing, but yet with a bearing that reflects his glory. 
Moses went out unto his brethren. He knew who he was. He knew with whom he must identify. The next phrase, he looked on their burdens. Here Moses is seeing something new. Moses has grown up in the palace. Moses has been sheltered from all the rough things out there. But 40 years old, he says, I'm a man now. I get to go out. I'm going to see what I want to see, and I'm going to go out and look around. I wonder how things are with the Hebrews. After all, I know that's where I came from. He looked on their burdens. Something Moses had never had to bear. Things that Moses had never had to do. Every time Moses was sweaty, someone would take a fan and fan him or cool him with cool water. When Moses was hungry, he always had a feast set before him. But he suddenly realizes his brethren are in need. You know, one of the interesting things that I noticed as we went to the ICCC conference down in Brazil was how many of the brethren did not have a whole lot. Brother Gary Johnson and his wife Pat had arranged for three Kenyans to be with us at that conference. And they had the privilege of speaking, and praise God, they speak English. <laughs> kind of tough English to understand, but we understood them. And they have a deep love for the Lord Jesus Christ. But it was quite evident, after spending some time with them, that they do not have much. We are a people who have not yet learned to bear burdens, who have not learned what it is to have nothing to eat. We have not learned that when you go from here to there, you do not drive your car for those five miles, you walk. The day may come when God will let us, in his grace, learn those lessons. The next phrase. He spied an Egyptian smiting an Hebrew. Moses sees not only the work and the sweat and the toil and the suffering and the starvation, but now he sees something that makes the anger rise in his blood. He's gone to see his brethren. He's hoping this will be a nice experience. And suddenly he sees an Egyptian, one of those with whom he has grown up in the palace, smiting, dealing deadly blows to, which is our word there, one of his brethren. Now it's interesting, the word brethren is used twice in this passage. It's interesting to remember that Moses had a physical brother by the name of Aaron, as well as his sister Miriam. I wonder if in the context here, though God doesn't make the big point of it, he was hoping to go home and see his family, see how they're doing. And on the way, he sees someone with whom he identifies as one of his brethren. Folks, there will come times in life when things make you very angry. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Moses was angry and Moses sinned. Now, in most societies, there have always been laws for self-defense. And if someone, and it's true in the United States, if someone exercises deadly force against you, you may respond with deadly force. If they don't exercise deadly force, you cannot respond with deadly force. The same is true in terms of protection of another. If you see someone using deadly force, against another person, you may respond with deadly force for the rescue of that person. But if not deadly force, then you cannot use deadly force. 
Moses sees an Egyptian smiting a, he a Hebrew. But there's a caveat here under ancient Egyptian law. Egyptians had special rights not granted to Hebrews because Hebrews were now viewed as slaves. It's also been the case in every age with every form of slavery except under Old Testament law and we don't have time to talk about that here but there were laws under Old Testament law to protect slaveries, slaves but we find that it was not so in Egypt. That protection was not provided for slaves in Egypt or in other nations. And so Moses does something which we discover occurring in multiple passages of scripture. What Moses does is exactly the way sin entered into the world, exactly the way that sin occurred in the camp of Israel, exactly the way we see sin taking place in the life of David, exactly the way that we see sin occurring every place that we see it. It says, he looked this way and that. You see, Moses knew that what he was about to do was wrong. He looks this way. He looks that way. Doesn't see anybody. Moses' conscience was already at work on him at this point. You know, there's a good rule of thumb to follow whenever you are in doubt. If you have to look around to see whether or not somebody's going to see you doing it, when in doubt, the answer is no. Just use that as a rule of thumb. It's right 95% of the time. When in doubt, the answer is no. Young people, can you say that with me? All you older people too, let's say it together. When in doubt, the answer is no. Let's try it again. When in doubt, the answer is no. You see, normally doubt comes because your conscience is pricked. The Holy Spirit reaches down and tells you there's something wrong, even if you can't figure out what's wrong at the moment of it. When in doubt, the answer is no. And then it says he saw that there was no man. <laughs> oh, how short our vision is. There was no man, well, not quite. There was an Egyptian, but he's dead. Now we kill him, so he's out of the picture. There was one other man. The one who was delivered. The one who was a brother of Moses. And you know, in spite of that, word got out. Do not think that you will ever be able to hide your sin. But Moses had a very short sight there as well because it was not only that one man who saw him. But there are others who are always watching us. God is watching and he so controls the events to make sure that our sin is exposed. The holy angels are watching. The demons are watching. The great cloud of witnesses in Hebrews chapter 12, uh, uh, chapter 11 are watching. And Paul mentions that in chapter 12, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The next phrase, he slew the Egyptian. You see, what starts in the heart always ends in overt sin. James chapter 1, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Something in your heart is going to be what ultimately draws you into sin. Now listen to verse 15. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Anybody who tries to teach you different than that is a heretic. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. That's what we see taking place here. It says, he hid him in the sand. Never assume that your sin 
will not be reported, even if you try to hide it. Even by the one who you think you helped. For example, you young people, helping a friend to cheat on a test. You know what? It will be exposed. Or expecting a friend to cover for you when he catches you drinking or taking drugs. And remember also, now he's got a lever over you. And he can always use that to sort of manipulate you into other things that he wants you to do that are evil. Or having at work, those of you who are employed, a friend punch in for you at work or punch out for you on the company clock, expecting that it will not be discovered. We could give many illustrations of this. We always try to hide our sins. We know it's wrong, but we want to cover it up. Here's another principle to live by. If you have to hide what you're doing for fear of being caught, it's probably sin. If you have to hide what you are doing for fear of being caught, it is probably sin. You know, there are four stages in the progression of sin. We find those four stages here with Moses. We find them in the lives of others. Here are the four stages. Number one, saw. Number two, coveted. There's something in the heart that takes place. Number three, took. Number four, hid. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Remember that? When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. Remember Eve. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, she saw it. And that it was pleasant to the eyes. And a tree to be desired. There's the desire, the covetousness to make one wise. She took, there's stage three, she took of the fruit and did eat and gave also to her husband with her and he did eat. And then that fourth step, the eyes of them both were opened, they knew that they were naked, they sewed fig leaves together, they made themselves aprons. They heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day and Adam and his wife did not prance out and say, how do you like the new garment I got down at Macy's? They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. I wish we had time. We do not to go through the whole illustration of Achan. But you remember the children of Israel have defeated Jericho. Now they're going to try to do some mop-up operations around. There's a little city next to Jericho called Ai, which means a ruin. There's a nowheresville. And... They go to battle, they are soundly defeated. Verse 1 of Joshua 7 says, But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing, for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, of all tribes, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Remember something, your sin will affect other people. They went to battle, they were defeated, Israelites who had no knowledge of what had been done, were killed. We find that after Joshua goes before the Lord, God tells him that there's a, Israel has sinned. There's an accursed thing in the camp. God didn't say Achan has sinned. He said Israel has sinned. We have accountability one for another. And God holds us accountable when there is sin in the camp. God holds us accountable when the one who has dealt sin and we know of it is not dealt with. We get down to the end of that chapter and we find that Joshua calls Israel by their tribes. And the tribe of Judah is taken. So there are the 11 other tribes that they know that's not where the sin is located. Then he takes the tribe of Judah and he brings the family of the Zarhites man by man, and Zabdi is taken out of that family. And then he brings the households, man by man. And Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, was taken. And the last few verses of that chapter, Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel. Make confession unto him. Tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. You see, he had done some hiding. 
Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. He should have confessed that long before this. You see, it's only when he's finally caught that he admits his guilt. How often do we as Christians go through the same routine? We think, well, you know, they may have narrowed it down to my division of the company, but they don't have me yet. Or we as children in a family say, well, you know, they, somebody did such and such, and, you know, they, they finally have figured out there's probably somebody in my family, but they haven't got me yet. People... We have a God who knows everything. We have a God who has guaranteed that he will expose evil. You will never get away with your sins. Achan answered Joshua, When I saw the spoils, a goodly Babylonish garment, and 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them. What's the first thing? I saw. Second thing, I coveted. There is the desire and the covetousness, same as we saw with Eve. I took them. There is the third step. And behold, they are hid. There is the fourth step. In the earth, in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. Joshua sends the messengers. They find it. They bring Achan out and stone him to death. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. The principle is your sin will find you out. And so will, by the way, your works that you have done that please God. The issue here is not that someone will find out about your sin. It says your sin will find you out. It's the book of Numbers, a guarantee that Moses gives to the children of Israel as they're about to enter the land, and two tribes say, we want to remain behind on this side. We want to possess our possession over here on the eastern shore of Jordan. And Moses warns them about the wrath of God, and he tells them, your sin will find you out. That's like a vicious beast of prey. Your sin will hunt you down until it catches you and kills you. Our time is up. I have so much more to say. This is such an important issue. The issue of sin. When we come into the presence of a holy God, I want to talk about the temporal versus eternal viewpoint, the choice that Moses made, the, the way in which sin affects others around us, how the principle applies to the church. Multiple verses, we don't have time for them this morning, we'll have to wait till next week, but multiple verses that tell us that you cannot keep your sin secret. God will expose it. And it's all through the New Testament. Oh, so many more things. But the Lord willing, will save those till next week. I think, though, that at this point, it does remind us that we are about to approach the Lord's table. Dear, dear, beloved flock, sin in the sight of a holy God is an awful thing. We serve a jealous God. He will not tolerate our false gods. He will not tolerate our rebellion. He will not tolerate our iniquity. In a few moments we'll have a chance for silent prayer that we might bring our sins before him and confess them and make things right before we come to his table. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. It is indeed a powerful word. It reminds us that you are a holy God. And we are a sinful people. We pray, Father, that you will keep us from thinking that we're doing your will when we're walking in the flesh, as Moses did. From mistiming things that we know are your will, but now is not the time. Keep us, Father, from those things 
where our conscience reminds us that we're wrong, but we look this way and that way, and we see no man, and so we go ahead and do it anyway, with terrible consequences. Help us to know the truth of your word. Be sure your sin will find you out. Thank you, Father, once again for the privilege of studying your word this day. We pray that you will bless it to our hearts, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.